Hi, everybody. Happy Easter. So glad to see you. If you didn't hear me, my name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor here. And guys, for hundreds, if not at least about a thousand years, Christians have greeted one another with this thing that we keep saying over and over. And it's, he is risen. He is risen indeed. I mean, it's just this new way of celebrating how Jesus unbelievably changed everything. Uh, so we're so excited that you guys are here, especially if you're a visitor, first time ever to Surrey Hill Church. Uh, this coming August, our church will be five years old. So we're pretty young and uh, here in Lawrence. And we moved into this location about a year ago. We met mobile at Bishop Seabury Academy for about three and a half, four years. And uh, we just are thrilled that you guys are here today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are uh, kind of in the middle of a, a sermon series looking th through the book of Philippians. But today we're pausing and we're focusing all of our attention on the splendor and the majesty and the glory of the resurrection and the empty grave. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus did the impossible by bringing Jesus back to life, okay? There is no greater event in history. And while our like Sunday morning that we wake up to right now uh, is filled with all sorts of just, you know, Easter vibes. I mean, let's be honest. Like, who got an Easter basket this morning? Anybody? Love it. <laughs> who gave an Easter basket this morning? Okay, yeah. And that probably had some, like, eggs in it and some candy, you know? Did anybody, like, do some dyeing of colored eggs this weekend? Okay, respect. That's a lost art. Okay, it's pretty messy. <laughs> we just buy them now. They're colored. Uh, is anybody hiding eggs later? today? A few? Yes. Love it. Love it. We're doing that as well. Um, I mean, Easter, like, look at me. I've had so many people comment on, like, you're, you look like a giant Easter egg, man. I'm just going to crack you open. I'm like, I don't know how to take that. Like, pastel colors, you know, the brunch thing, dressing up, nothing wrong with any of these things, okay? They're so much fun. But today, I want to actually zoom back into the past and look at the very first Easter Sunday morning. If you, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 24, the gospel account of Luke, towards the very end, chapter 24, where he records the events of the very first Easter Sunday. And I will tell you that things were quite different from the excitement and fanfare that we have today. There were no baskets, there were no candied eggs. It was a very, very different start to the morning. And so I don't know where you are coming into this morning. Uh, maybe you got invited here and you do not claim to be a Christian. You're still on that journey of like, well, maybe I should think about this or who is this Jesus guy? If you're here or maybe you're watching online today and you are not yet a Christian, not yet a believer, a follower of Jesus, we just are so excited that you're here and we want to encourage you to investigate, like look at the details, ask your questions, consider the events of the empty tomb. And if you are here and you are a Christian, um, I just would also encourage you to not let this information be old news. You, you, we don't graduate from the, the resurrection and from the empty tomb. It's something that we should see afresh every time we read it. And so we're going to jump in to Luke 24, verse 1. You got it? Nope, nobody has it. Okay. Got it. Okay, let's dive in, all right? 24, verse 1, we will have everything on the screen for you. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared. Okay? Two days earlier from this moment, most of Jesus' followers witnessed him brutally tortured and murdered on one of the worst torture devices ever created by man, the Roman cross. And these followers of Jesus, including some of his family members, they watched him die, pulled down from that rough wooden cross, and watched him be buried and put under Roman guard. 
there was fear of malfeasance and some things that might be happening that they thought were shady. And in this first Sunday morning, this first Easter, their miracle worker, their loving leader was dead. And so Luke 24 starts at rock bottom. Their Saturday Sabbath had ended and Sunday began hopeless. So they headed to the tomb to continue their burial customs and their traditions. Let's continue on. Verse two. It says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but pretty much all historical scholars, non-Christian and Christian alike, basically agree on three things about Jesus, okay? Christian, non-Christian, the skeptics, everyone agrees on these three things, okay? Jesus was a real person in history with a large following of people. Two, He, Jesus, was killed by the Romans and buried in a known tomb. So he wasn't placed in like a mass grave or anything like that. Three, three days later, that tomb was empty. Everyone agrees on these things. This information should spur us to ask questions. Uh, I'm probably gonna like hit like a, a heartstring here by asking this question, but did anyone ever growing up have a loving dog or pet? Okay. You raise your hand, show me, yeah. Okay, now, did that pet die and you buried it in the backyard? Yeah? A few, okay, okay, that's like a, there's a moment there, you know, and I'll never forget the first dog that I had, German Shepherd, I love this thing, and she, she finally died. And we went out, we had like kind of a larger backyard, it was about half an acre, uh, no fence line or anything like that, and we buried our dog at that tree that kind of was out in the back of our yard. And, you know, for a long time, there was like that, that you see the dirt mound, you know, that's coming up. I, I just try to imagine for a second, those of you who've, who've buried a pet, okay, that like the next day you look out your back window and that all that dirt is dug up. You know, what would you immediately think? Like, oh, that's pretty normal. You know, it's just another Saturday at our house. No, you wouldn't think that at all. You would maybe coffee in hand or, or whatever, you'd run out there and imagine then if that dead animal was gone. You would have questions. You would. You would be like, that neighbor, <laughs> what kind of sick person would do something like this? I mean, you would immediately start thinking of like, why would this happen? Like, was the dog alive and we accidentally buried it? I mean, you would just start having... <laughs> You guys are going to have to ask Dana, our worship pastor, one time uh, or sometime about when he buried a hamster that wasn't dead. Um, I'll let you deal with that later, okay? But we would have questions. We would, okay? We wouldn't just think like, okay, well, that, you know, it's pretty normal. No, we would not do that at all, okay? We should have questions. And when we read this account and knowing that I mean, the most trusted non-Christian and Christian scholars, they just agree. Yeah, he was real. He, he was murdered. And the grave was empty. And of course, then things develop as to how you interpret that. So Luke continues to record the events. So let's look at verse four. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. Does anyone else picture, I, for some reason, I just picture like the, the full jumpsuit, like the track suit that's just bedazzled, you know? You know, it's, really, it's pretty comfortable, you know, and they're just standing there and lights are on them somehow, you know, like, 
they're gleaming, you know, like what is happening in this moment, okay? So the original Greek language for that word dazzling, it literally translates to they gleamed like lightning. Has anybody ever stared at lightning before? I mean, it's, it's like, oh, okay, hang on, you know? Has anybody ever been close to a lightning strike? That'll mess you up, okay? You got PTSD the rest of your life, okay? You're done. Can you, I mean, this is who is standing in front of them, okay? These dudes are not normal. They are supernatural messengers of God. So what would your response be? Just think about it. How would you respond to something like this? Verse five. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. Their question is profound. Profound. In fact, I've been reading this for weeks now and I have not been able to stop thinking about the depth of this question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? This question speaks to all of life. A few weeks ago, I confessed very humbly and with a lot of trepidation that I was a product of the the 90s uh, church youth group skit culture. And I lived it fiercely, okay? And um, I didn't actually tell you about the, the greatest skit that we had ever done before. Uh, does anybody know the song uh, Totally Clips of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler? You know, turn around. Yes! Raise your hand if you don't have a clue what we're talking about right now. Okay. 1983, Bonnie Tyler drops this album. It's got this song, Totally Clips of the Heart. And the whole, it's just like, turn around. Every now and then I get a phone. Turn around. And it just keeps going, okay? So, of course, you know, good youth pastors back in the day were like, well, let's, let's turn this into a skit. I mean, I mean, we just turn around. I mean, how easy does this get, you know? So in this skit, there's this girl, and she's like, you know, living life, and she's doing her thing. And all these people, perfectly in number to the turnarounds in the song, okay, they're turned around, okay? And, the, and she's walking by, and the first one goes, turn around, and they're holding a sign, and things get real, real fast, as it did in the 90s, okay? And it's just like drugs, you know? And she, she walks over, and she's like, okay, and she does a lot of like physical drug references, like why are we doing this, right? And then the next one, turn around, alcohol, and she's just like slamming, you know, turn around, promiscuity and sex. I mean, we're like, what is happening here, okay? Like, and it would just do this over and over, and then they like surround her, and then Jesus shows up and like takes care of everything. <laughs> the number of times that I performed that skit was, was scary, okay? So it's like drilled into me. But the thing that has stuck with me is actually the core of its message. How many times, as silly as something like that can be, how many times do I, do we, desperately search for life and things that bring us no pleasure? And we desperately search for things that are dead. And we're like looking for the life that our soul wants and we just settle. We settle for the things that the world offers us. And these angels, these messengers of God, they cut right to the heart. This is a grave. They're looking at these girls. They're like, yeah, I know you just showed up for, with your preparation spices and to you know, keep things going, but this is a grave. This is where death is. You saw Jesus laid here. He's not here. He's not here. You should be looking for the living because he is not dead. Verse six. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember 
how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. So these messengers had to remind these gals of Jesus's words because they did not remember that Jesus actually promised that this would happen, okay? Stop and think about like the absurdity of a claim like this, okay? All throughout history, people and religious leaders have made claims. Just hundreds if not thousands and thousands of predictions and claims to do something, to be something, or claim that something would happen. Any baseball fans in the house? 1932, I think it was game three or four of the World Series. Babe Ruth steps out. You guys know the story? And he's got two balls and two strikes, and he points. And he he makes this prediction, like, I'm going to drive this out to the outfield. And he hits. And people, have, to this day, they still talk about, like, wow, like, what skill, what, like, incredible gift that someone, like, there's never been another baseball player, you know, and Lou Gehrig is there watching it happen. And it's like, he made a prediction, right? So predictions are fascinating, but when they come true, they are compelling. And he just knocked it out of the park. It went exactly the place that he put it. Now, did he do that the next time he got up to bat? No, I mean, like, because things would eventually go sideways for his predictions, right? He, he, there's no way he could keep that up. Every person that developed a religious, excuse me, religious following is dead. Every person. We can go visit their tombs where their bodies are buried. No one ever promised over and over again to die and then come back to life. Christianity is the only faith where God himself purchases humanity's redemption. In no other religious belief or system do we find their proclaimed God actually suffering for the sake of humanity, suffering so that humanity can be redeemed. All other systems of religious thought and faith teach either that we learn to accept the way that life is or we attempt to redeem ourselves. And you can go and visit Jesus' tomb as well today, but it's empty. Thankfully, God's power to raise Jesus from the dead is not determined by our <clears throat> belief in the news. Look at how Jesus' disciples responded in verse 9. It says, returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11, those are the 11 disciples, and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles, okay? They're telling his disciples over and over these things. But what happens? But these words seem like nonsense to them. And they did not believe the women. No matter what, God keeps his word even when it involves things that seem impossible. I'm just like trying to put myself, I'm glad that God didn't like make me an angel or make me Jesus. I'm gonna just recount that statement, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm putting myself in like the, the messenger's shoes and I'm just like face palm, you know? Like, come on. Like Jesus said this over and over. You would think that Jesus's followers would be lining up like, like rope drop at a theme park that's about to open, you know, on Sunday morning. Like, he said it, let's go and check, you know, like, let's go, drop the rope, you know. You would think that they would remember. He said it over and over and over. But no, 
It's more like today with Jesus having so many skeptics. The very first skeptics that Jesus faced were his own disciples. It's fascinating. For three years, the disciples watched miracle after miracle. And while they were often amazed, they never doubted. You know, Jesus is like, And the disciples are like, man, he just turned a bunch of fish and bread and he just healed some people. Like, cool. They're amazed, but they're never just like, no, I don't know if he did that. I mean, is there like a backpack that he's reaching into or something? You know, I don't know what's going on. Like, they, they never doubt it. They're just like, wow, amazing. But when it comes to the resurrection, that first Easter Sunday morning, they had to be persuaded. The show me attitude, the prove it attitude. And the girls in this story, the women, were more responsive to what God had done than his own disciples. So I'm curious, where are you today? With this story, with this truth with this historical data, because you can only have one of two positions. I believe, I do not believe. And so the empty tomb demands a response from anyone who hears about the news. So if you have yet to put your faith and trust in Jesus and committed to him, even though you still might think like, well, I don't know all the answers yet. I, I need to work on this. Like, you just continue to read the stories of the gospels and look at life after life that Jesus just welcomed. No one had to put themselves together first because the truth is we can't. We can't earn his grace. He offers it freely. And if you have yet to make that decision, your response today is to investigate. Investigate the tomb. Look what happens next in verse 12. Peter, one of the disciples, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only linen cloths, so he went away amazed at what happened. He heard, wait, 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 wait. The tomb is empty? The one that the Roman guards were guarding, where we laid Jesus, it's empty? And he didn't believe yet. So what did he do? He investigated. I need to go see for myself. I need to go find out. And so if you have your questions, we celebrate those questions. Your response need to, needs to be to investigate the empty tomb. There is an immeasurable amount of evidence I wish I could do like an entire series on this. Like, like for one, women were the first ones to find the empty tomb. In that first century culture, women's testimony was not, you couldn't bring it to a court. So if it was all a lie, why would the disciples choose women to be the first ones to find that out? Doesn't make any sense. If it was a fabrication, they would have figured out a smarter way for that belief to be known and you take a look at the disciples themselves, they went from skeptics, a hot mess, walking with Jesus for three years. And then as soon as the resurrection happened, it was only a matter of time before all of them, most of all of them, were put to death, dying, being murdered themselves, standing on the, the claim, he has risen. Their worship changed. These were devout Jews. They worshiped on Saturday, traditional time for Sabbath. And all of a sudden Jesus rose and they're like, well, that happened on a Sunday. So um, yeah, we're gonna meet on Sundays now. Um, and they changed millennia worth 
of church tradition. Their worship changed. And then Jesus' own family, it records in the Gospels that at one point, his, Jesus' family members were trying to get him and pull him away from the crowds. And they were asking him, bro, we think you're crazy. And then all of a sudden, all his family moved from just son to brother to Lord. Jesus' enemies believed. A devout Jewish man named Saul was murdering Christians. And he found out about the resurrection. And he met Jesus. And he became Paul. And his life changed. There were 500 eyewitness accounts in the book of Acts. The church exploded into growth. But most importantly, a dead body was never found. Because so many people saw the living body. And there's like theories that are against this, that the disciples stole the body and, or Jesus' enemies stole the body or the, the women went to the wrong tomb and even Peter, when he ran, went to the wrong tomb or that Jesus didn't really die. That's called like the swoon theory. And like everyone that saw Jesus, this is probably one of the most far out there one, quite literally, pun intended, is that everyone who saw Jesus was hallucinating the same thing. I mean, people have come up with they have attempted to come up with so many theories to try to explain this historical fact. The tomb was empty. And if you are a skeptic, we are so excited you're here because you're just like Jesus' disciples. We welcome your questions. Investigate. And I trust that you will find what we have found is that God did the impossible. Did you know that the resurrection was not created by the church. The church was created by the resurrection. It changed everything. And it changes everything for everyone, for you. And so what did the women do that believed? If you look at this story, these 12 verses, they saw the empty tomb and they believed and they remembered what Jesus had said. What did they do? They ran and told. And so if you believe, your response to the empty tomb is to go. To go and tell. Jesus is alive. He is it, the one with total and undeniable authority. He's the forgiver of our sin, redeemer of our salvation, and perfecter of our faith. And as Lord of all, the good news must go out to all. I heard a friend say recently that Jesus doesn't save you to sit you. He saves you to send you. Jesus is alive. This morning we have the opportunity to celebrate that truth being lived out in several individuals through their profession of faith and their belief. And they're going to share their story and then get baptized in obedience to, to what exactly Jesus asked us to do.